Welcome to The Metabolic Link, a medical and science-focused podcast that explores the common thread of metabolism in health and disease. This is where science meets society. Welcome back to another episode of The Metabolic Link. Today, we're sitting down with Dr. Lucia Aronica to discuss how nutrition affects our epigenetics, how an individual's genetic makeup influences which diet is most suitable for them, and what biomarkers can be utilized to assess response to diet. Dr. Aronica is a lecturer and research scientist who focuses on how diet can change gene expression and how we can use this information to design personalized lifestyle interventions for optimal health and longevity. This interview was recorded in partnership with the Charlie Foundation at Metabolic Health Summit 2022. Thanks for listening, and we hope that you enjoy. I'm Lucia Ronica, um, PhD. I am a lecturer at Stanford University, and I'm the R&D lead for genomics uh, at Metagenics Inc. Uh, the focus of my research uh, is uh, nutri-epigenetics, uh, which describes the science of how the food we eat can uh, affect our genes function through epigenetic mechanisms. So epi means on the top in the Greek language. And so epigenetics is the way uh, that uh, modifications on the top of our DNA can regulate which genes are turned on or off in our cells. And this me- makes, the, this, this explains why, for example, we, um, uh, we change in response to a diet. And so I'm specifically looking at how the epigenetics of people changes after going on a low carb or a ketogenic diet at Stanford University. And I teach courses on this topic. Um, my courses are on uh, nutrigenomics, which is a, a broader field. So nutrigenomics is uh, the science of uh, how DNA and diet dance with each other. And the first step is uh, nutriepigenetics, which we have described. The second step is nutrigenetics, which is the way our genes can affect how we resp- respond to the food we eat. So it's a really two-way uh, communication. On one hand, our genes can affect our response to food and from the inside out. And on the other hand, the food we eat can affect the way uh, our genes work from the outside in. And this is nutrigenomics. So it's a complex topic. Usually people pay attention more to nutrigenetics because it's what is more popular now, now that direct-to-consumer genetic testing is available. Uh, But I think uh, probably uh, nutri-epigenetics is a more powerful tool that we all have in our hands to make sure we control our genes, not the other way around. I was born as a a molecular biologist working on epigenetics, a single cell uh, model systems. Um, And uh, but at the same time, in my private life, I I was a a food as medicine enthusiast. And I was also um, during my PhD doing, doing strength training. And so I was experiencing through my dietary um, experiments with low carb, um, extraordinary changes in my blood lipids, which were surprising. So I am Italian and uh, it's obvious from my accent. And uh, I, I, I was used to eat a high carbohydrate, low fat diet. Uh, during my PhD, I switched to a low carb diet. And as a result, uh, my, my lipids changed completely. So my, I had a, a, redu- a threefold reduction in my triglycerides and uh, uh, a twofold increase in my HDL. So my HDL skyrocketed from a, a healthy value of 60 milligram per deciliter to, to a, a value of 135 milligram per deciliter, which I, I have uh, now. So anyway, I was just curious about this low carb field and I wondered Can I apply my molecular biology knowledge to nutrition? And so this was actually a a radical change in my career because um, at that time, so I did a PhD working on epigenetics in uh, in tetrahamena thermophila. 
the model organism in which telomeres have been uh, uh, identified. Telomeres are the chromosome caps that are associated uh, with longevity and the clock of our cells. And then I did a postdoc working on another epigenetic modification in yeast. So I was already on uh, very much specializing in this niche of molecular biology. So it was a quite radical change to then decide to come to Stanford University to investigate yet another type of uh, epigenetic modification in human cells and in the context of a clinical trial of low-carb diet. But that, that has been the best decision I ever made in my life. Um, so the study that I joined at Stanford is called the Stanford Diet Fit Study. And this is the largest randomized clinical trial ever undertaken to compare a low-carb and low-fat diet. Uh, with 608 overweight people who were randomly assigned to either a low-carb or a low-fat diet that they maintained for one year. And so this, this trial is just a gold mine of samples and data. It's the best data that most researchers can get their hands on in the field of low carb. So um, they didn't plan to do an epigenetic analysis. So the, the study was, was planned as a, a precision medicine trial. So the main outcome was weight loss, comparing the weight loss effects of low carb versus low fat on, uh, on, uh, in these people. But then they were also planning to investigate the microbiome, the metabolome, the proteome. They didn't have any plan for epigenetics. So I wrote an informal email to the uh, PI, um, the principal investigator of the study, uh, Professor Christopher Gardner, and uh, he was, he just uh, uh, told me, yeah, why don't you join the team? And I was surprised at that time I was uh, in Oxford during finishing my, my postdoc, and uh, I decided yes. So now I'm a lecturer uh, at Stanford where um, I'm still uh, collaborating with, the, with Christopher Gardner on several analyses of the diet fit study um, and on new trials comparing keto, uh, different versions of a keto diet, a Mediterranean version of keto uh, and a standard keto diet. And at, Met at Metagenics, I'm leading some uh, um, precision lifestyle medicine trials investigating the, the role of nutrigenetics and selecting really the nutrigenetic variants that really matter in terms of clinical utility and scientific validity. Because um, unfortunately, the information that, that is out there in most uh, common, in the common genetic report that people uh, take uh, online is not um, based on uh, solid science. Um, so there is some good, some bad, and some ugly. And actually, this is the title of my presentation at, uh, at the Metabolic Health Summit. I will present uh, the nutrigenetics of keto response, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so um, this is, uh, um, my presentation will, uh, will provide um, a snapshot of the state of the art uh, in the um, nutrigenetics of keto response. And I will draw examples from uh, a review study that I published with uh, Angela Poff, Dominic D'Agostino, um, and uh, Jeff Folek. And so, uh, and I will try to uh, make this information accessible to a larger audience. And so that's why we didn't categorize the genetic variants in the review in the good, bad, and ugly. But I, I'm using this, uh, this framework uh, for people to better understand. And I, I, I hope that by the end of my lectures, uh, people will understand how genetic genetics can affect the way people respond to a keto diet, um, identify the useful and useless information in their genetic report, and also evaluate whether or not genetic testing can help, help uh, them evaluate whether keto is right for them. That fit study is not really a keto uh, study, it's more a low-carb study. What I did is I really look at the whole methylome um, uh, through a technique that is called whole genome bisulfate sequencing. And so 
I, uh, we, we see something that's very surprising. There is a very, very little overlap of changes in epigenetics between the low carb and the, and the low fat arm. Why is it is surprising? Because the, the diets were a little overlapping in terms of macronutrient composition. The low carb was a mild low carb, but the low fat ended up to be mildly low fat. And yet, the changes in, uh, in, uh, in um, DNA methylation are extremely different. Um, so in our discovery analysis, where we just looked at everything, uh, we, uh, we, we selected the top 10 hits, hits and we see that, for example, on the low-carb arm, arm, we see um, fat metabolizing genes that are upregulated, whereas in the low-fat uh, arm, there are several genes that are upregulated. Most of them are some cancer-protecting gene tumor suppressor genes in the, for colon cancer. Um, we still didn't publish those data. Um, we will publish them eventually. Uh, other analyses have uh, had pri priority. But I think the most uh, practical um, finding of that study was um, that we also looked at one single epigenetic marker uh, for type 2 diabetes. So this is a site in our DNA that when we gain weight, and we develop diabetes, it gets hypermethylated. Methylation is one of these epigenetic modifications. So it's a sensor of the environment, of gaining of a, an obesogenic environment that, that eventually leads to type 2 diabetes. So imagine that we have this site, this epigenetic sensor that gets methylated. Now, I looked at this specific site before people started the diet and one year after when they completed the low carb and the low fat diet for both arms the methylation decreased when people as people lost weight and uh, were were eating a whole food diet so the good news is that it looks like these uh, epigenetic marks that are linked to metabolic disease are written in pencil that can be erased with lifestyle. So I think that's probably the most practical and powerful message of, uh, of our epigenetic analysis that we, when we look at something that is demonstrated uh, in many people, the, the site I'm talking about is a, is a marker that has been validated in more than 100,000 people in epidemiological studies, a rob robust uh, type 2 diabetes uh, marker in the epigenetic field. And so it's reassuring to see that these changes, and it might be potentially used as a biomarker for type 2 diabetes to uh, really uh, pinpoint patient that starts to develop an impaired glucose metabolism before uh, they, they, uh, they manifest the traditional risk factors for uh, uh, type 2 diabetes, hemoglobin uh, A1c or higher glucose. Sometimes these changes can, can uh, start very early and can reverse rapidly. In our, in our study, uh, we, we measured the, the changes after one year, but we don't know whether we might have seen even changes at six months, right? So anyway, um, it's a fascinating study and it's wonderful to work at Stanford. I really enjoy working uh, with the team of Christopher Gartner. And again, we didn't, uh, uh, this is, this, these are unpublished data that we may refine. So we, we, we need to uh, refine the analysis and look at significance level, but, we, we see improvements on both, both diets, which indicates that weight loss, so this is also important to uh, note, this was a weight loss study, right? So, um, of course, these people had a, an overmethylated uh, site because they were overweight. And so, um, of course, when they lose weight, it may not matter whether it's low carb or low fat. But another important um, uh, factor to consider is that both diet were lower in carbohydrates compared to the standard American diet. They were both, both whole food 
diets. And I think everyone agrees that if we eat whole foods, it doesn't matter whether we prioritize the fatty foods or more the vegetable and fruits, but we are going to eat less carbohydrates than when we consume refined carbohydrates, bread, pasta, sugars. So they were both low carb diets. One was more uh, low carb and with higher fat, fat, uh, fat intake, whereas the other was more um, lower in fat and higher in carbohydrates from fruits and vegetables and uh, legumes. It's not about living longer, it's living longer, better, happier every day. And so I, I look at metabolic health like really the heart of our health. And we can do it, uh, we can take care of it every day through enjoyable activities, like learning how to eat um, um, uh, nutritious food, exercise, stress reduction, is also an act, an act of taking care of us. I think really uh, metabolic health is for me the heart, the home of health. And it's something that actually democratize, if we switch the, the focus to metabolic health, we democratize health for everybody. Because focusing on these is easier than, for example, curing a disease when symptoms arise already and it's more expensive for people and also it's uh, I think uh, taking away a lot of quality of life um, in the life of many people. Yeah I hope that um, probably we can uh, um, we can educate um, a larger public about the importance of metabolic health. What it is and why it is important, why, why, why we can actually control, we, ha we have control on our health. And, um, and this is tricky. It, uh, it, it will take the efforts of scientists, communicators, policymakers, because unfortunately also the system, the food system in which we live, can make for many people difficult to make choices every day. So I really, my hope, is that we can bring metabolic health to a larger audience. I know that all, all the people are at the conference today, they're already convinced, they're already working on, on their metabolic health. Uh, what I care about are the people that we can't reach now because there are barriers. And I hope that also through advocacy and meetings like these, we can reach more people in the future. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Metabolic Link. If you're enjoying this podcast, please share, subscribe, follow, and leave us a comment or review on whichever platform you use to tune in. We hope you'll join us next time.